Yo! Yo, yo. Welcome back to the Anti-Monopoly Happy Hour. I'm your host, Ron Knox, Senior Researcher at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, your friendly neighborhood Monopoly Crusher. It's Thursday, June 17th, 2021. We're back like a vertebrae. Ah! Ah! You know the vibes. It is absolutely lovely uh, to be here with you all this evening. Thank you very much. It is also very lovely to be joined by our co-host for this episode, ILSR's own Jess Delfiaco. Jess, what's happening, friend? Hey, I'm uh, so excited to be making my Twitch debut here today. Getting my face out there on the internet. Couldn't be more excited to join you, Ron. Look at that. <laughs> ah! Lovely. Very, very good. All right. Boy, we got a big week. What a week. What a week it was. Let me tell you, my friends, we've got news coming up. We're going to talk about the big homie, Lena Khan, now leading in the driver's seat at the nation's uh, primary, I'll say primary, anti-monopoly uh, agency, the Federal Trade Commission. Extraordinarily exciting. Also exciting. Five. Count them five. One, two, three, four, five. Bills introduced in the U.S. House, all aimed at cracking down on monopoly power. Couldn't be more excited about that. We'll talk all about those. The bipartisan bills, by the way. We're very excited to talk about this. And we have an incredible guest, a legendary guest, literally the greatest antitrust reporter on planet Earth at the moment from Politico, Neil Island. Leah Nylon is going to join us. An old friend, by the way, a homie from a uh, hundred years back, it seems. So we're excited to chop it up with her. But first, I feel so celebratory. Let's figure out what we're going to celebrate with. Beer of the week. Today, today, I got, I got so, I got so hyper local for this beer. Brewery Imperial, let me show you backwards there. Brewery Imperial, which is like, uh, like dead ass a mile from my house here in Kansas City, by the way. Middle America, middle of the country. And um, it's called the Biscuit. It's a pale ale. Pretty damn good, let me tell you. Pretty tasty. One of, the, one of my favorites at the moment. Always keep it on stock. And it has, as we, as we do, Right there, there it is. See that little little beer bottle, friends? Look for that sign every time you purchase uh, an adult Bev from the store. It means that the beer you're drinking is owned by uh, a nice little company. Sometimes a nice little company, sometimes a kind of nice medium-sized company, but definitely not a beer monopolist. Uh, definitely not some terrible private equity roll-up. It's owned by local yokels. In this case, definitely owned by local yokels. That's my beer of the week. Jess, Jess, what you got? Ron, well, I got to say first, you said hyper local and I expected you to like pan over to where you were brewing beer <laughs> in your garage or something. Oh, <laughs> so bro. it's not as local as you had me thinking. Season two of the happy hour. I'm starting my <laughs> own brewery. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm, you know, not a huge beer person myself, but I do have uh, a gin and tonic. Uh, and I do have this one of my favorite gins, which is from, from uh, Vikra Distillery. That's in Duluth, Minnesota. They are fantastic little family owned place. Um, like can't recommend enough how good it is. It's like juniper harvested from the hills of the, the Minnesota mountains up there by Duluth. Good stuff. All right. That's great. The happy hour, look, not everybody's happy hour is beer o'clock. It just happens to be my personal preference. And, you know, you actually, last week, you did have my favorite beer, uh, or you mentioned my favorite beer, I should say, which is Two Hearted Ale from Bell's. So I couldn't do that and, like, repeat last week's beer. So break it up. Two Hearted, Two Hearted Ale. Gotta love it. The, uh, uh, the like, the Pabst Blue Ribbon for Aging Hipsters. <laughs> we love to see it. We love to see it. <laughs> All right, time for the news. Let's do the news. Was there news this week? Nope. Just a sleepy, sleepy week. Look, hey, look. First of all, let me tell you. We, in this 
in this in this neck of the woods, in like the anti-monopoly world, some weeks are very sleepy. Let me tell you that. So there's just sometimes there you're just it's just you're grinding along, friends. And then some weeks, every single thing happens. And that's what happened this week. The big news, lots of big news. But one piece of the big news is that Lena Khan, uh, who had been nominated back in April, I think, nominated to join the Federal Trade Commission, one of our two fine antitrust uh, agencies, enforcers here in America, along with the Justice Department, Antitrust Division, um, nominated to join in the FTC. It was a big deal then because she is, I think beyond a shadow of a doubt, one of the most prominent and most powerful anti-monopolists in America. And I said at the time that her nomination was uh, the most significant addition to the Federal Trade Commission since at least the New Deal, if not ever, I think. And that was big news then. Then this week, the Senate voted on her confirmation to confirm her to the FTC. She won by a landslide, Republicans and Democrats. And then two hours later, President Biden decides that she is going to be the person to chair the FTC, be in the driver's seat, and do all the things that, that, you know, that come along with that. Um, and what, that are, what are all the things? We're gonna tell, us, about, tell us all, what are the things? We're going to talk about all the things. I want to quickly, we're going to talk about all the things. I want to quickly, I'm going to play a video of Lena because I want to give our, our viewers, our, fr our, our friends out there. And the, she was being interviewed uh, this a couple of years back. She had just published a paper about the separation of online platforms like Amazon and Google and Facebook and so on and commerce. So the separation of the platform with the same companies doing business on those platforms. We talked about that a lot last week, but I'm going to play, I'm going to play that video real quick and we'll come back and we'll talk about how, uh, how crucial it is, how incredibly uh, revolutionary I would say it is that she is now the chair of the FTC. So my new paper um, is called The Separation of Platforms in Commerce, and it's focused on a particular regulatory principle. Um, and this principle basically says that if you're a dominant intermediary, um, if you're a dominant network, you should not be allowed to enter lines of business that place you in direct competition with all of the businesses that are reliant on your network. So, you know, 100 years ago, railroads transformed America. There were, in some instances, monopolistic. They also started then buying out coal mines and entering various kinds of commodities business, businesses. Um, this caused all sorts of disruption because all of a sudden the independent coal producers found that you know, they would go to the railroad and, oh, guess what? There were no cars that were available for the independents because the railroad was privileging its own coal. And so Congress ended up doing a big investigation and ended up passing a law that said um, common carrier railroads are prohibited from transporting any goods in which they have an interest. And so this basic principle um, we've continued to apply in the banking industry and in telecom um, to TV networks. Uh, it was a part of the AT&T breakup. Um, and so this paper really kind of revisits that history and identifies the various goals that these remedies sought to promote. And my aim really with this paper was to recover this history of breakups that I think has been lost. Um, you know, in the last few months, there have been various presidential candidates and various policymakers talking about breakups. And I think, you know, one avenue of reaction was really like, oh, this is just a really exotic and extreme remedy. This is un-American. Why should we punish success? Um, and I think revisiting this history reminds us that actually, you know, when you're a dominant intermediary, when you're a dominant network, there have traditionally been a very separate set of rules that we've applied because we see these uh, market players as different. All right. All right, so there you have the, now the head of the most powerful anti-monopoly enforcement agency in America speaking at length, and of course she's written at length as well, but speaking at length about our rich history of breaking up powerful companies. The same powerful company, let's say, the same powerful companies 
that are now firmly within her remit as as the head of the Federal Trade Commission. So it, I, I can't express how remarkable this is and what a sea change this is from um, the last 50 plus years, probably even more uh, of like, you know, leadership uh, at the Federal Trade Commission, certainly since the early 70s. So. Uh, Ron, I'm curious if you would you say this is or isn't the reason that Jeff is shooting himself into space? I would say, yeah. I mean, look, <laughs> if I were if I were Jeff Bezos, buddy, I'm putting myself. I don't want to be here either. Yo, I'll be in space too. That sounds like a much a much nicer um, a much nicer, less regulatory environment than than what's uh, than what's going to face Amazon and the other big tech companies and probably a litany. Uh, of other industrial monopolies and oligopoly. Oligopolies just means like we're like a few, a handful of companies control an industry. Oligopolies around um, around the country, with Lena Khan at the helm of the FTC. So let me show. And I, first of all, so okay. So that's it. So that's me kind of that's me gushing a little bit, but it really is massively um, like it's like such an unbelievably substantial decision um, you know, by the Biden administration to say, we're going to put one of the foremost anti-monopolists in America in charge of the foremost anti-monopoly company, uh, sorry, agency, and see what happens. Okay, okay, that's how we're going to do it now. That's different. And, and let, me, let me try to explain how, how quickly this happened, okay? All right? Here's where we started. Here's how this started. A law school student has an idea in 2017 in the New York Times. This week in the New York Times, the law school student, now the chair of, uh, of truly a sleeping giant of, of American regulation. So let's talk about what she can do now. As chair of the FTC, she can... Uh, one of the most important roles here is that she can appoint staff. And these are, this is the staff that is going to be like hands on really day to day um, investigating possible infringements of the law, looking at mergers when they come in to figure out whether or not they're going to harm competition. And then deciding, okay, we think that this, this action by this big, powerful company or this merger is going to hurt competition. It's going to hurt um, the economy. It's going to hurt workers. It's going to hurt consumers and so on. Then what are we going to do about it? And, you know, uh, having the right staff in charge of the various parts of the Federal Trade Commission is huge. And it's going to really matter to enforcement because that way, from, I'm sure from Lena's perspective, it means the right cases are going to come before her and before the other commissioners so they can decide whether or not to, to file lawsuits or to, or to do whatever else they're going to do. So that's huge. Sets the agenda for the agency. Sets the tone for the agency. All right. Can, can begin the process uh, of rulemaking, truly one of the underutilized powers of the Federal Trade Commission to make rules to police the economy, say what companies can and can't do uh, under the law, and so on. So, look, maximum respect to the administration and to, you know, and like, by the way, to everybody who lined up behind her, she, could, <laughs> she couldn't possibly, they could, <laughs> the administration could not possibly have picked a uh, a person who was less popular among ex extremely powerful companies and their lobbyists and their lawyers and their lackeys and their spokespeople, okay? But the administration said, you know what? Fuck it. This is what we need right now, which is a statement in and of itself about the economy and the state of the economy. And we're just, and we're, and we're doing it. And we're going to put her out there and a whole queue of people lined up in support of Lena Khan, in support of her nomination uh, to the FTC. And you can see what the result of that was, right? This like massively 
one-sided vote in the Senate to confirm her to be essentially the nation's top anti-monopoly enforcer, top trust buster. You know, she didn't mean, she, look, she never minced words. She never minced words. She never acted like she was, I've seen, goddamn, I've seen people, I've seen one person after another line up uh, and say they're going to do one thing, give big policy speeches, you know, um, talk a good game at these big conferences that Leah and I have been to a million of, and then not do anything. When it comes, when it comes time to enforce the law, not do anything. Lena Khan didn't, hasn't minced words. She, so she just, she just in, the, in the clip I played, she sat there and said, we need to re-embrace our rich tradition of breaking up powerful companies. So we haven't seen an FTC, I don't know, powerful or fully, you know, like on their game like this in what, like a hundred years? If uh, he, like, if look, even that, I, so I'll like, you kind of know what, what's possible, but like, what do you actually expect? Like in the next six months or the next year, like what are, what? Yeah. Yeah. And look, these are these, I mean, um, I don't know what to expect. I don't know how quickly things are going to happen. Right now, there's a Democratic majority at the um, at the commission. There's an anti-monopoly majority, I would say, at the commission. It's a five. Per By the way, it's a five person commission. And it's always three to two in favor of uh, the party of, of of the president, the party in power. So at some point. Well, look, Democrats, two Republicans, all three Democrats are. Um, outspoken against, you know, corporate power in favor of reining in the, the, you know, the monopoly power that's that's really coursing through the economy. Uh, one of those one of those commissioners, Rohit Chopra, is due to leave any time now. He's going to go ahead another agency that does consumer protection work. And when he does that, it's going to be two to two. And that's going to handcuff what the agency can do for. Uh, you know, when it comes to bringing contentious cases, the cases that um, that maybe the Republicans on the commission don't want to bring. But at some point. It's going to really be three to two. And you would you would <laughs> you would suspect that, you know, from all indications from the selection of Lena Khan, you would expect that the, um, you know, the fifth commissioner to join whenever that happens probably later this year, early next year, uh, is also going to be someone who has some deep concerns about corporate power. So once that happens, I mean, really, this, you know, sky's the limit. But when that happens, I don't know. That's that, that's really going to be up in the air. I think what can happen in the short term in the next in the next few weeks, maybe some rulemaking, maybe, you know, some some, you know, beginning the kind of um, sort of arduous process of rulemaking. Um, maybe opening up some 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 new investigations and so on, but we'll see. I don't know about that. And I will. Talk I will. I will say yeah. that uh, Leah was correcting me in the chat when I uh, was being overzealous with my FTC history, and I skipped over the seventies. So just, the 70s, just point I, yeah. that out that a hundred years is, is uh, a little too long. I was gonna. Well, I mean, it's it's been an agency for for more than a hundred years, but um, but uh, I will. I'll talk. I want to. I want to get into a little. A little storytelling about the FTC because I think it's important, and I do want to talk about the '70s because that was really the last time, and maybe the only time, not the only time, but one of the only times that the FTC has really been emboldened, has really been like a powerful actor, um, uh, you know, at least at least attempting to reshape the American economy to be more democratic and 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 um, uh, and so on. So. We'll talk more about that. Let's get to some more additional news. Can you believe it? There's so much going on. The United States, the United States House of Representatives, and one of our two fine legislative bodies. Uh, last week, this week, what week is no? Last week introduced. Last week, by the way, last week, because of Leah Nyland and her incredible reporting, literally 
first uh, to to publish the legislation, draft legislation, forced <laughs> lawmakers to introduce the bills early. So they introduced them last Friday. Five different individual pieces of legislation, all of which aimed at um, reigning in monopoly power, uh, really, you know, breaking up the big tech companies. Amazon, Google, Facebook, Apple, maybe Microsoft. Uh, preventing them from um, swallowing up smaller rivals or smaller companies in other industries so they can expand their monopoly that way. Uh, and preventing them from discriminating against, uh, or I, would, I should say discriminating in favor of their own products when those products are in direct competition with the small businesses and the app makers and the people who rely on their monopoly platforms to reach the market, to, to, to find customers. Uh, this is a water, I'll, I'll, I'll real quickly, I'll, I'm going to pop up the, the story here. Where I write sometimes, because life's weird. And I'll read this paragraph here. The re okay, so this is talking about, these are bipartisan bills. I want to I want to make that clear. These are bipartisan bills. Each one of these five bills had at least one Republican co-sponsor. The rare cooperation in a bitterly divided Congress underscores the mounting bipartisan interest in overhauling federal competition laws to address long-running allegations that Apple, that Amazon, Apple, uh, Facebook, and Google have engaged in monopoly-style tactics. The members this gets to kind of what these things do. The measures would outlaw some of the common ways tech companies allegedly solidified their digital dominance and in the most severe instances force them to sell off lines of business that represent a conflict of interest. That is truly, truly the crux of the matter. So this, so like, I don't think I'm being, I don't think I'm being hyperbolic or whatever. Uh, in saying that this is a watershed moment in the history of antitrust law in America. Uh, and, and truly in the history of our relationship that is like our, us, people, regular people, like the democracy, our relationship with corporate power in, in America. There's really only a couple of other instances And the American people, through our representatives in Congress, have said, look, there's, like, there are companies that have such control over such wide swaths of our economy that it's making it so that the rest of us can't have the kind of basic liberties that we think we're all entitled to here in America to, you know, start a business, compete in an open market, reach customers without being interfered with by some, um, some unaccountable private power. You know, to read the news without it being filtered through a lens of what's the most profitable thing, what's going to sell the most ads for Amazon and Google, what's going to keep our eyes on the page. Uh, sorry, Facebook and Google. What's going to keep our eyes on the, on the page the longest? And so on. We have these kind of expectations in America about what it means to be here, what it means to have liberty and have a democracy. And there have been very, very few instances where we've said, okay, all of those things are being impeded by, you know, by power, by corporate power. And we're going to draft a whole series of laws just to break that down, just to get past that thing. Look, we have a rich history of anti-monopoly in America. But 
a lot of that's been enforcement. A lot of that's been um, local, but on the local level. Scant few times have we said, okay, we're, we, you know, we are taking big action to reverse a half a century of, um, of this erosion of our liberties in the hands of corporate power. Anyway, that's it. That's a big, that's a, that's a big thing. So let's talk about, the, okay, so let's say real quickly what the bills are going to actually do. I think the most important bill, so ending platform monopolies, basically says if you have you own like a platform, a monopoly platform that is a thing that other companies, other service providers, other app makers, other retailers have to be on in order to succeed, in order to just make it then you cannot, as the, as the platform owner, you cannot then go out and compete with all of those people who rely so heavily on your infrastructure. Because that is a conflict of interest. That is unfair. It's an abuse of monopoly power. And, it's, and it's in, in, in some instances, it's attempting to extend a monopoly in one thing, which is the platform, to a monopoly in like other things which is whatever the other business is. Does that make sense? I struggle sometimes to kind of describe what, how, like how that works. Does that make sense? Well, it makes sense to me, but, you know, <laughs> I've actually heard this before. <laughs> yeah, you've heard this before. But, you know, it's, it's, it's Amazon, you know, being like a store, it's being a platform, a place where you could, you know, as an individual business owner, independent business owner, um, but yet they're watching what you do and they're making maybe the exact same, very similar version of the product and selling it for cheaper or putting theirs, you know, higher on the search results page. Um, and what are you going to do? Leave and sell on a different platform where people don't shop? Right. Probably not. Right. Right. I mean, exactly. And, you know, and uh, um, you think about Google and YouTube. For those who don't know, I'm sure everybody, every, like everybody basically knows this, right? But But Google owns owns YouTube and, and Google has a clear, like no arguments about it whatsoever, monopoly over search, online search, right? So you go to Google, you as a person, customer, you're like, I go to Google, I'm going to go to Google. I go to www.google.com and I type in, Lena Khan videos. I don't know. And then what are the things that come up right at the very top of the search results? It's inevitably, almost invariably, YouTube videos of Lena Khan. Even if those videos are originally produced by another, another like website or another, like even like another competing video site. It's going to be those videos that live on YouTube that's going to come up in the top of the search results. So one of the main things, one of the main things is kind of the big bill. I think of it as the kind of the, like, the big bill uh, is going to do is say, you can't do that. That's it. You cannot do that any longer. Right. Instead of that happening, what, here, here's what's going to happen. Those big monopoly platforms are going to have to sell off those companies. their other little interests. Right. Not their main platform. You know, Google doesn't have to shut down search. It probably doesn't even have to stop selling ads. That's how it makes money. But it likely will have to do something else with YouTube. YouTube will have to go off on its own and be its own company. And... The thing that will do is create this kind of real unfettered competition between YouTube and every other video site on the internet without the backing that like infinite piles of money and political power 
and bargaining power of Google behind it. Okay. That's what the fair, that's what a fair market looks like. That's what an open market looks like. And I talk, look, I've done some of you, might, some of you might know, uh, I've done some extensive reporting about monopoly power in the music industry. And let me tell you the thing that people in the music industry, just for, just for, for an example, uh, the thing that they say is, look, the problem with YouTube is that it can lean on this massive user base of Google. So when YouTube is bargaining with record labels and artists, music rights holders, for a contract to stream their music on its site, it can say, we have 4 billion users, okay? Or whatever, whatever the number is, but something like that. And they wield that number like a weapon in these negotiations to push down the royalties that they pay to artists and to record labels. So that essentially there's next to no way, essentially no way, unless you're a massive artist like, you know, you're Drake or you're, or you're Taylor Swift or you're Justin Bieber or whatever. There's no way you're making uh, any money from streams on YouTube. As a function of, of Google's monopoly power, wouldn't the world be a better place if YouTube did not have that behind it and instead had to negotiate on more even footing with um, the record labels of the world? So just an example. So this is talking about significantly reshaping the economy in ways that will allow innovation and entrepreneurship and independent business to thrive and to better and to, and to be better for, for us, you and me, people like, you know, Joe Schmo like shops on Amazon. We've all learned at this point that like Amazon, for example, we've learned this through Carl Racine is the attorney general for Washington, DC learned this through his lawsuit that the prices that we pay on Amazon for things are like wildly inflated. Because Amazon forces the small businesses that sell on Amazon to buy all this other stuff, all these other ancillary lines of business that Amazon operates. You got to buy the shipping and the storage. You got to buy the ads. And all of a sudden, the price that you pay for stuff goes, goes through the roof. So, so the idea is, at the end of the day, break all the stuff up. And the whole thing works better. Works better for everybody involved. Every different little like, like actor in this economy. Okay. So it's exciting. And I don't want <clears throat> to look. I don't want to spike a football before we cross that goal line. <laughs> That's not going to happen. Because these tech companies, they mean fucking business. They're out there now to right now as we record this this like dumb show. They've got an army of lobbyists out there talking a, a, a whole game about how uh, these bills are going to kill innovation. They're 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 un-American. They're um, uh, they're a government overreach. They're going to be bad for consumers. On and on. So there there are miles to go before we reach that you know that goal line. But good first step. That's that on that. That's that on the bills. That's that on the bills. No other big things. I mean, there's more to talk about, but we only got an hour. I want to get to story time. Story time. <laughs> story time, chumps. I want to talk a little bit about the Federal Trade Commission in a sultry voice. Let me tell you about why the F Getting us that ASMR audience. Yeah. Let me tell you why the FTC even exists. Look. 
there's this, I want to start here. Let me start here. There's a bill introduced this week on the Senate side. This is like the evil bizarro world version of the bills on the House side by Mike Lee. And who? Leah, Chuck Grassley, who? Grassley. Mm hmm. Mike Lee and Chuck Grassley. Introduce this bill that would strip the FTC. <laughs> now led by. The most prominent trust buster of her generation. It would strip the FTC of. Uh, its authority to enforce the antitrust laws. Okay. So. I want to talk a little bit about. Why that's happening. Historically, why that's happening. And then. About. How, you know, to reflect a little bit about how, how important it is to have um, to have Lena Khan as the head of that agency. So. The early part of the 20th century, we just start, we just, we as a country just started enforcing our antitrust laws and we weren't very good at it. And for a long time, they were on the books for a couple decades ish and we didn't really do anything with them. We used them to like, like to go after unions and do dumb shit. Basically. And then finally we said, okay, there, there, you know, this is the Gilded Age. There's clearly corporate, concentrated corporate power, this, this new industrial power in America and had, and had gone beyond just affecting, you know, farmers and small sellers and, and, and so on, which was really the kind of origin story of the antitrust laws. And it started affecting way bigger chunks uh, of commerce, including our energy industry, for example, and um, and so on. So, so we go out, we America, we go out and we sue Standard Oil, the Standard Oil Trust, this massive monopoly that was integrated with the railroads and that was and that was cutting off um, American business like in multiple parts of the economy. I and mean, we went after them and said, okay, we're going to break up Standard Oil. And we did. When we broke up Standard Oil, we poisoned the well. We poisoned this brand new well. <laughs> because the Supreme Court, when deciding Standard Oil, said, look, we have to decide these cases by rule of reason. And that means we have to weigh all, all these different kind of competing things before we decide to break a company up, before we decide to actually enforce the, the anti-monopoly laws. Okay. And what that did was it opened the door to all kinds of bad actors, all kinds of corporate lawyers and, and, uh, and economists and all kinds of various arguments about what things are harmful, what things aren't, how big is too big, all this stuff that clouded the picture of what was intended to be a very clear law um, to rein in corporate power. So early 20th century, he said, okay, this is, this is, you know, this can't work. First of all, you have JP Morgan doing all these mergers all across the economy, all these roll-ups, consolidating power, rolling up the steel industry and, and, and so on. And then you have these judges that are, um, that are deciding uh, a law intended to be decided by um, the democratic power of Congress. So what happened? So they decided to pass a few new laws, one called the Clayton Act, intended to address mergers and to stop these you know, roll-ups from happening and to address 
you know, predatory pricing and a bunch of other stuff. And then they're going to create the Federal Trade Commission. And they created the Federal Trade Commission because they said, this agency, this is going to be the one. We're, we're, we're not going to have judges decide this stuff anymore. It was never meant to be decided by the, um, by like, you know, unelected and essentially undemocratic judges. It was intended to be decided by, you know, by Congress and by extension, the agencies that are beholden to Congress. And that's what the FTC is going to be, the Federal Trade Commission. Um, it's going to be able to enforce the antitrust laws. Plus, we're going to give it its own law to do even more than just the regular antitrust laws. The antitrust laws could, could, could you know, attack these little issues, could stop this conduct and this conduct and stop these mergers. But there's... But the world is full of possibilities, basically. The world is full of possibilities, you know. And um, and so we're gonna and so we're gonna give this agency the power to go after stuff that we haven't even thought we as in Congress has haven't even thought of yet that might run afoul of competition, might be unfair, and um, might be hurting small businesses, workers, uh, consumers, and the economy overall. So that's the history of the agency. And from time to time, the FTC has actually used that power to, um, you know, to do things that, um, that, you know, preserved a competitive economy or that tried to, to democratize industries. It didn't always work, right? So, Let's fast forward. So we have so we have the FTC between between about the New Deal ish and the 1960s. The FTC was a pretty useful agency. It would run afoul of Congress it, it, because it was so beholden to Congress, and Congress holds the purse strings to its budget. It would sway in the political breeze a little bit, right? But generally, a pretty effective agency. And then in the 1970s, it said, "We're going to do even more." There were these reports that were generated in the late 60s, early 70s, looking at the whole economy and saying, boy, you know what? You know what's troublesome is that we have all of this concentrated power all over the economy, right? This isn't just like, we're not talking about a monopoly. One co company controls this industry. One company controls this industry. These reports looked at, looked at the, whole, uh, the whole economy and said, you know, we got, we got this industry over here controlled by three companies. We have this industry over here controlled by three or four companies. They basically don't, these companies in their little, in their little bubbles of their own industries, they don't really compete with each other, not in like a real way. The prices aren't so different. The quality isn't so different. There's not a bunch of new selection. But what they do do is they make sure that no one else gets to come into that industry and compete with them. They put up what, what the term of art, the term of art is called barriers to entry. They put up these barriers to entry. And these reports said, this is not, this isn't good. This isn't a good thing. Yet people are paying too much. Nobody, entrepreneurship is, you know, struggling. People can't, can't um, start these new businesses and, and, and enter these, these industries and really compete. And, um, we're all suffering. We got to do something about it. So the FTC in the 70s says, you know what? OK, all right, we can do something about it. Because we have this law again, we have this law that Congress gave us. Just for things like this, just literally just for instances like this, that traditional antitrust laws can't really get at this stuff. They can't just say. Uh, you have three companies in an industry. We don't really like that, so we're gonna make you. We're gonna break it up. We're gonna break. We're gonna. We're gonna break this industry up. That's not really what the what the Sherman Act and the Clayton Act can do. But the Federal Trade Commission says, you know, our own law. We can. We can probably do this stuff. And so they tried. They did. They brought lawsuits against. Uh, Three cereal companies, if my memory serves, Post, Kellogg's, and General Mills. 
And they said, these three companies, they don't really compete on price. And they, and they dominate the shelves of major supermarkets in a way that uh, essentially prevents any other cereal maker from coming in and gaining a foothold and competing on a kind of level playing field, as they say. So the FTC in the 70s sued to deconcentrate an industry with three companies. Kind of the tone of your voice is making me worried that they didn't succeed. They didn't succeed. They didn't succeed. But I want to just I want to just emphasize how wild that is. How many industries in America today are dominated by three or four companies? Are oligopolistic, as we tend to say. And the FTC tried, man. And they did the same thing with oil companies. And they said, these oil companies, they don't compete on price. They control access to the customer. They control access to the market completely. We've got to break them up. So they wanted to make, they wanted to take, in, in, the, in the case of the cereal companies, they wanted to take the three cereal companies and bust them up into nine cereal companies. Get the fuck out of here. So there were moments in the FTC's history when this was possible. And that is why it is so, I think that Lena Khan understands the power of this agency implicitly. Like she gets it in her heart, in her core. And, um, you know, this is a once in a century opportunity. This is the head of the most powerful uh, antitrust agency in the country. Lining up with Congress, bipartisan, by the way, in the House and the Senate, ready to bring new laws onto the books, to hand to this person and say, go enforce them. Um, I mean, again, not trying to spike the football before it's time, but bro, we'll see what happens. But these are all good things. These are all good things. All right, that's story time. That's it. Tragic story of the FTC. No, not the tragic story, but occasionally disappointing story of the FTC. I want to introduce our guest, our guest of honor this week. She is a reporter covering technology, nominally technology, I believe, at Politico. But she is a veteran antitrust reporter. Um, she sat through every cringy, boring, freaking antitrust trial on Earth. She's covered every uh, tragic merger. She's broken story after story. All she, all she writes are scoops. Ladies and gentlemen, my friend, Leah Island. Leah, what's up? Yo, how are you? You know how I'm doing, man. You know, you <laughs> see how I'm doing. Yeah, I just listened to you for 45 minutes. That, I bet that wasn't good. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. Woo. Yeah, no, I mean, going back, history lesson, you, you, did, you left out some of my favorite parts, you know. Somebody, I was actually comparing Lenacon to some of Nader's Raiders this week, and somebody was like, why do you know this stuff about yeah. the history of the FTC? And I was like, I'm a nerd. Nader's Raiders, what's up? <laughs> Nader's Raiders, for all you non-FTC history nerds, were a bunch of college students who in 1969 spent their summer writing a report about the FTC that then led to significant legislative changes. See, college students. College students are where it's at. They're unencumbered by <laughs> the weight of failure. No, I don't know. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, probably like the weight of mortgages or something. I don't know. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, let's talk about legislation. Let's start there. Yeah. Okay. So um, you, of course, right? Like without a doubt, you published the the bills before they became public it's true i did yeah. drafts the drafts of the bills 
and uh, you know, uh, forced him into the sunlight. And you've been <laughs> and you've been reporting on the legislation since. So I just want uh, and like you know, I realized you have your reporter hat on, so this is not um, uh, not asking for any opinion on anything. But I'm curious what you're hearing out there. I'm, you know, you kind of like you got your your finger on the pulse of this stuff. What are the f- yeah? What's the feeling around these bills? Um, you know, like what they purport to do, whether they're good or bad. What are their chances of becoming law? What are you hearing out there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's the five bills. Um, they have varying levels of support. There's one of them that pretty much everybody loves. Definitely going to become law. Already actually passed the Senate. This is the one that would um, dramatically increase the amount of money that people have to pay to have their merger reviewed. And the idea is, you know, the people who are forcing all of the agencies to do all the work should probably be shouldering some of that burden, not the taxpayers. So the people who are, you know, having $30 billion mergers all the time, they're going to have to pay more to have their merger reviewed. That one has bipartisan, lots of bipartisan support. And then there's four others. Um, They're slightly interlocking um, and they have varying levels of support. There are three Republicans who are on all four. Um, One of them is Ken Buck, who is the um, top Republican on House Judiciary Antitrust. Um, Very smart on this topic. Uh, and uh, Madison Cawthorn, guy from North Carolina, Lance Gooden, somebody from Texas. They're on all four of them. Um, And the most controversial of those is the one that you mentioned, I think probably the most, uh, the breakup bill, as I like to call it. This is the one that's uh, sponsored by Jaya Paul, um, which is pretty impressive because Amazon is in her district. (laughs) Um, Talk about like, you know, thumbing your... (laughs) I mean, your nose and some uh, some of your constituents, but um, that one is probably the one that has the the least support um, among uh, Republicans. And then you know the other ones are a little bit in the middle. So um, one of them would ban all um, mergers of potential competitors. This is to stop the Facebooks of the world from buying up Instagram and WhatsApp. Um, also to encourage like all of the VCs of the world to stop like investing in stuff that the big companies want to buy and instead start investing maybe in some things that can challenge the big companies. Um, You can imagine that a lot of the VCs and startups don't love that bill (laughs) because it's definitely going to change how they work, um, sort of how they plan for the future, lots of things like that. Right. Um, The two, there's two others that are really interesting. They're both a little bit interlocking. There's a non-discrimination bill. Um, This is the one that's uh, Cicilline's baby, Uh, Cicilline being the uh, House Judiciary Antitrust Chairman. Um, It would prevent the companies from discriminating against rivals that compete with them. So Apple can no longer, you know, discriminate against Spotify and promote Apple Music all the time. Um, That one has um, a little bit of interest in the Senate. Uh, Amy Klobuchar, who is the top Democrat on antitrust issues in the Senate, has said that she is thinking of sponsoring a companion bill. So I think um, that one uh, probably has has some legs. Um, The other one that's pretty interesting is called the Access Act. It um, requires interoperability, which is a word my editors absolutely refuse to allow me to put into stories because they think it's too complicated. <laughs> I, hey, I, I, I agree. Think I don't like it. I don't like it. I know what it means. I know what it means, but you know, it's not, it's yeah. not uh, regular human speech. I don't. It's think. not a human speak. Okay. Yeah. So it just means the ability to like easily transfer your data somewhere else. So you could be like, "Hey, I'm tired of using Facebook. I really want to move all of my stuff over to this other cool social network that's very similar to Facebook, but different." So the whole idea is they would have to build tools. It would literally make for users or companies to transfer their stuff. So not just users. So like Facebook would have to make it easy for users to leave. Amazon would have to, this one I thought was pretty interesting. It it would actually require them to make it easy for um, marketplace sellers to move their listings, take their reviews with them, take all the stuff, you know, that they have set up in Amazon's marketplace to another marketplace. Um, Yeah. Yeah. So that one, interestingly, has the support of this, like, um, 
Republican from Texas named, uh, no, I'm sorry, he's from Utah, Burgess Owen. <laughs> and he got up at the press conference, which was yesterday, and started talking about how he thinks it was brilliant because when he, you know, he was a football player back in the day for the New York Jets. Okay. And then when he stopped playing in the <laughs> NFL, he went. Sorry, the New York Jets are not the NFL. No, the New York Jets are the NFL. I'm just surprised. Okay. Like, I'm laughing at myself for, for not okay. knowing this stuff. I'm like, oh, okay. I was like, yeah. He, was a he went right. and he started working for Nextel. And at the time, Nextel was like a tiny little telecom. But this was right around the time that the FC, FCC passed rules allowing you to take your phone number, your cell phone number, yeah. between providers. Number and so all of a sudden, Nextel, which had great customer service and cheap prices, was able to get lots of customers because it was easy for people to transfer their phone number. There you go. So he thinks this is a brilliant idea. And that's, and that's why Nextel um, is so big today. Well, Nextel got bought up by Sprint. I know. <laughs> I know. Just a joke. Just a little. I was really hoping for a good football metaphor to come out of uh, that. I was waiting. Okay, so it's like passing a foot. Ball, but it's information. <laughs> but not me for the football metaphors. <laughs> I might actually start talking about how they pass the puck. But that's a different sport, I think. Um, yeah. So while you were talking, we had some breaking news out of the House Judiciary Committee. They said they're marking up these bills Wednesday, 10 a.m. Wednesday. So, yeah, we heard that. We heard put that. a note on your calendar. Yeah. 10 a.m. Yeah, we got the inside scoop on that one. I got to tell you, we got the ins- we got an email about about I don't know two hours ago. Ugh, you knew before me, guys. Sometimes I know um, things, not often. Okay. <laughs> once in a blue, Occasionally. Once in a blue moon, man. Once in a blue Is this moon. like we drink and we know things? We're like... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Um, let me ask you this. I want, uh, I want you to reflect on this a little bit. Because you've, yeah. you've been doing this for a long time. And we used to be, by the way, we used to be like in the trenches together all the time. Just Back when we were baby reporters. Baby reporters, man. We're cover we're just like covering this stuff. Chasing <laughs> chasing officials around the halls of hotels. The JW Marriott. The JW Marriott. <laughs> Jesus. Jesus. Um uh, Do you think that we I mean, how wild is it? Or not wild? How like how do you feel about this like in the moment? Like, did you expect this? Could, like, could you look back like five years, eight years, 10 years back and see a trajectory in the law and the politics where you thought we would get to this point where, where this stuff is, you know, it's breaking news, it's making headlines, you're getting alerts on your phone from the New York freaking Times talking about... Lena Khan uh, yeah. joining the FTC in these new bills. Could you see a, you know, could you see this, you know, kind of coming or is this a surprise to you? Um, I think to, you could see today coming a couple of years ago. Um, you know, I think sort of by, by mid 2018, like early 2019, you could sort of see the trajectory we were on that there was a lot of anger about big tech And there was like building anger about the concentration in the economy and something was probably going to happen. Now, things at the agencies and Congress take freaking forever. I guess, you know, I heard you use the F word. I can use the F word too. They take fucking forever around here in Washington. They do (laughs) take fucking forever, no doubt. Um, But did did I see this coming back in 2013? No. (laughs) I mean, you can look back today and see the seeds of it, right? Mm -hmm. Them not, not doing anything about Google. And then the agencies sort of consistently like wearing blinders about big tech through the rest of the Obama administration. But I mean, you sort of have to like look back on it now to notice. All right. So you brought it up. So let's talk about it. <laughs> Good off. You wrote, I'm going to, I'm going to share this. You wrote this story. And I, and I, you know, you're just a, you're just a reporter, you know, you, they shoot it right down the middle, but you can't mistake the headline and what the headline says. How Washington fumbled the future. <laughs> it's been a whole show of football metaphors. Let's have one more. How Washington fumbled the future. <laughs> the story that you broke, easily the most important, and anti- I think the most important antitrust story of the year. Of maybe we'll the see. Last, maybe we still last, have half a year. We still have half a year. But this is a big story. <laughs> And you detailed how the Federal Trade Commission, that we've been talking all about this show, 
had a case in front of it. It had conducted this lengthy investigation of Google, Google's monopoly power, Google's, uh, and the way that Google leveraged its monopoly in search to promote some of its other, its other products. There's more to the investigation, but that's, that's it, you know, it really cut straight to, to Google's core business model of search. And FTC staff said, look, you got a case. They broke the law here. And between some economists at the, at the commission and then the commissioners themselves, the case never came. And like I said last week, and I believe this, this was a the, now now we're going to mix metaphors because I'm going to talk about baseball. This was a fat. <laughs> this was a fastball down the middle of the plate that the FTC did not swing at. They left uh, the agency left its metaphorical bat on its shoulder, which is inexcusable to me in baseball or in uh, corporate regulation. So. Uh, as you just said, it detailed kind of. Where we were, where the FTC was, you know, back then, 2013. And now we have, uh, a, we have an ardent anti-monopolist at the head of the agency. We have a lawsuit to essentially break up Facebook. We have a lawsuit from the Justice Department, funny enough, to go after Google. Uh, going after Google for some of the exact same allegations, by the way, that came to light in that FTC investigation. Um, what is that tell? What is this telling you as a reporter? Again, right down the middle. What does this tell you about where we are today um, as a country, politically, economically, perhaps, compared to where we were back in those days, back in 2013? I mean, so as you said, the uh, NA trust case against Google today by the Justice Department goes over some of the exact same things that the FTC looked at back in 2012-2013. And why? Because the search is the root of all of Google's power. That's where it is a monopoly. And it has, um, you know, according to the Justice Department and a lot of the allegations against it, it has used that power to leverage itself into other areas. So at the time, at the very time, um, that this investigation was going on was when it was really gaining a foothold in the mobile space, right? It started offering Android for free to everybody, but it had really restrictive contracts on what you could do. Um, you had to, you know, pre-install all of Google's apps on there. You couldn't install um, competitors. There, there's a funny thing in there about how Facebook was upset because Facebook was trying to get a deal with a bunch of um, telecoms to pre-install Facebook on there, but they couldn't because Google Plus existed. <laughs> wow. Wow. Boy. Yeah, that was one of the interesting things. So anyway, I, I read all 392 pages so that you do not have to, but... Um, <laughs> That was some of the interesting things in there, you know, like Google and Amazon also really mad about it. Google, I'm sorry, um, Amazon and Facebook were also really mad about Google. Yeah. <laughs> they okay. went and told the FTC, like, Google isn't good. Amazon was deliberately paying um, more for more expensive ads on Bing <laughs> because they did not want Google to be the only online advertising monopoly. I bet, I bet. Um, and so, like... When we say they fumbled, um, I think, you know, definitely looking back, they fumbled it. There are some things that in there that you like look at now, you know, now, you know, we have the benefit of <laughs> seven years later. But you look at these things and you're like, how could you have possibly thought that? That's that's pretty crazy. Like you guys literally did not have much of an idea about where the Internet was going. They completely missed like the importance of mobile to the future of the Internet. But if if you would talk to people who knew the industry, um, which I did, and they see that was the way it was going. Yeah. Um, so it really seems like the FTC didn't do enough of its homework here. Um, 
And the problem was once the FTC closed this probe, they didn't want to hear about Google again. <laughs> so for the next, you know, this was towards the beginning of the Obama administration. It happened right after Obama's reelection. So then for the next four years, the FTC didn't want to hear anything about Google. Even as Google, surely, even as Google's, even as the <laughs> Google's monopoly power became, if it wasn't clear back in 2013, Lord knows it became clear and clear as the years went on, being fades off into irrelevancy and, and so on, right? Yeah, I mean, over in, it's not as though the U.S. is the only country that exists in the world. Over in Europe, they were repeatedly finding Google. They, they find Google something like 9 billion euros, which is roughly 10 billion U.S. dollars um, for violating the antitrust laws. But the problem is, Google is a U.S. company. Like they can make them change their behavior in Europe, but they can't fundamentally change anything about the company because it's based here in the U.S. Yeah. Um, if they, they need, and they don't believe yeah. in, and they don't believe in breakups in Europe. They just believe. They don't in, believe in breakups in they Europe. They believe in fines. So. And Google, you know, Google has a, a money printer. They don't care. <laughs> uh, money printer go burr. My, you know, my word's not yours, but Google. But I'll say it. Google doesn't care. Google gets fined ten billion. Whatever, you know. Yeah, so um, it was very, it was really enlightening reading the 2013 stuff, seeing sort of where they very clearly missed. Um, And uh, it was pretty gratifying to see people in Congress and people in the agency, like, respond to the story. Um, Several commissioners uh, said that they, you know, think they missed this one. Um, And, uh, you know, it it was brought up at several hearings by... um, by folks uh, knowledgeable about antitrust, about how we need to ensure that the FTC does not fumble the ball again like this. Um, And so, you know, I think there will be a lot of scrutiny on how Lena Khan does the antitrust stuff going forward. I mean, because, you know, she is really exciting. She has a lot of great ideas. Ultimately, though, the people who do the work are the staff folks. And you have to overcome a little bit of, I think, resistance there to changes to how they do things. Yeah. Yeah. Look, and it's okay. So that's a good <laughs> segue into what I want to, uh, you know, ask next. Like speaking of resistance to the way things are done in the antitrust world. Um, no, that doesn't exist at all. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I want to explain to people out there who, who, uh, who, who are watching. And if you made it this far, bless you. Let me tell you, there's this thing that happens every year called the spring meeting. Oh my it's God, the, the spring meeting. American Bar Association's antitrust spring meeting. And this is like, however many, two, I'm, I'm going to make up a number, 2,000, 3,000. I don't know how many. It's usually about 4,000 4, people. 000. I like to call it antitrust prom antitrust because prom. anyone who is anyone is at antitrust prom. And it's filled. And this, so you fill a hotel in Washington, D.C., most non COVID years, fill a hotel in Washington, D.C with corporate lawyers and economists and um, so on. And you get them all together and they talk about, essentially they like swap tips about how to get their clients out of trouble. When on the rare fucking occasion, by the way, that they would ever get in trouble with the antitrust uh, enforcers. And then the antitrust enforcers show up they speak their language. They talk about the consumer welfare standard. They talk about doing things on the margins, which means not doing things. And everybody goes home. Everybody goes home and oh. s- swims in money and takes their yacht out. And you know, They actually know. don't go home. They go drinking they at go- all of the really <laughs> fancy parties that go- happen on the sidelines of the conference. They go drinking at parties with a, ch- with a cheese table as long as a reception hall. Honestly, journalists eat so well that week. It's like, <laughs> I look forward to it because, of, you know, the these law firms, they rent out entire restaurants. <laughs> you can, like, eat. Okay, okay, like, this is, like, I'm being such a journalist here. I'm like, free food. Oh, my God. <laughs> the free A. Hey. But also, you get the drunk people and they tell you things. I have some pretty things. legendary stories from spring meeting, which, you know, I probably can't tell. But, um. Yes. <laughs> but so that's how basically <laughs> this is a family friendly show. Everyone's slay. Yeah. Don't, yeah. Let's not, let's not get into anyone's uh, personal <laughs> affairs. 
<laughs> but look, it's everybody <laughs> slapping them. It's, it's everybody slapping themselves on the back. And um, swapping tips and then going back and, you know, this is all in service of what has for the last half century been really, really ineffective antitrust enforcement and really, really effective um, organized capital and 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 like legal apparatus around that. OK. Now in walks Lena Khan. As the most powerful motherfucker in the room. Yeah. How's that going to go down, my friend? <laughs> well, technically, she only gets to go to the Enforcers Roundtable, which is the last day in which all of the Enforcers sit in a row up on a stage and then answer questions that have been pre-approved by them in advance and usually don't actually say anything. But... I will note, I'm not sure she's actually ever been to a spring meeting. I think she was supposed to speak at this one. And then it was like right around the time that her nomination was. <laughs> so she pulled out last minute. <laughs> but, right. I mean, I think that tells you a little bit something about who Biden picked. Like he didn't pick an antitrust insider here. He picked somebody who has specific views about where antitrust has gone wrong. And views about how to fix that. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. No doubt about that. All right. Last thing. You, yes. You just, you just, it seems like a hundred years ago now. Because I know. Of, it was only a month and a month ago. It's amazing. <laughs> you sat through the entire trial of Apple versus Epic, which we've talked about on the show before. You don't need to go into the, into all, all, all the details, but suffice to say it was a lengthy trial packed full of what all antitrust trials are packed full of, which is incredibly um, boring, intricate, like details and economic theory and backstory and business models and ancillary evidence that doesn't necessarily even get at the main crux of the whole thing. That's true. Sat, I did that. And then you sat in there and you live tweeted the entire damn thing <laughs> what how many tweets was that buddy how i how, don't even how, know what? you didn't count them oh you gotta count them. <laughs> you gotta count them i mean i was i you know too I, many. I, too I got many my feed count. i got my feed on my on my um <laughs> on my tweet deck page and and it's just like oh damn like bro and like if you just catch one tweet you're like what are you talking about i like, know I people were know. like Leah, I like following you, but you just kept like tweeting like a bajillion things about this like games and like naked bananas, and naked I just bananas, I, I didn't even bro. know what you were talking about. And I... <laughs> they had to pull a picture of the banana out, right? Yeah. Um. So <laughs> I I was like, I'll say this: I was uh uh tried to pitch my editor on a story about it. are Apple's lawyers prudes because like they um. <laughs> They insisted that <laughs> Peely, who is the banana character on Fortnite, had to wear a tuxedo because there was something slightly untoward about a naked banana. And I was like, wow. it's a banana. <laughs> so not, and then they kept... <laughs> it wasn't like they kept put bringing pants... Him. It wasn't put pants on the banana. Put no, a it's tuxedo not wearing on, it's the just on the so banana. So the banana can go to dinner at yeah. a nice place. And then they kept them. Um, there was this like really <laughs> hilarious moment pretty early on where they kept talking about itch.io. I don't know if you know anything about itch, but it's like this independent marketplace for games. So like if you're a game developer, you know, a dude or lady, uh, you know, hanging out at home and you make a game, it could be like a really simple text-based game or something. Um, you can just like upload it to itch and then people can play it from there. And, um, <laughs> they kept insisting that it was like some CD marketplace or something. And uh, it's not, it's just an indie marketplace for games. Um, but like what if <laughs> Apple's lawyers had this like hilarious exchange where she insisted that the titles of the games were so offensive that they could not be mentioned in court. And I was like, wow. And anyway, what I really loved was that itch.io changed their adult um, sensitive adult content feature to be called um, unspeakable games. <laughs> <laughs> if you go to itch now <laughs> and you want to find a, uh, you know, adult themed game, 
just go to the unspeakable ones. <laughs> Is your is, is yeah. your is your brain okay? I mean, have you have you like, have you reset have you reset your brain from I took from some days off, from but I went mode. Your brain has to be in to live tweet an entire antitrust trial. It was like even harder than that, right? Because most of like because of COVID, there were restrictions on the number of people who could be in the courtroom at a time. So we put together a pool, right? So there could only be two reporters live every day. So I did three days live in the courtroom, but the rest of the time you had to phone in. So it's literally listening to a seven and a half fucking hour conference call of lawyers. And like, <laughs> you can't see the exhibits that they're talking about, right? There's just like a lawyer and a witness. And sometimes the audio is smudgy and you can't really, like, really hear them super well. And then like, you know, I started doing remote the week that all the fucking economists started testifying. And I was like, oh my God, <laughs> this is painful. And that was when I realized that most of the other people who were um, live tweeting it were game journalists, right? Because there were a lot of video game journalists really interested in the trial because of its impact on Fortnite. Um, and I was like, and they kept asking like lots of questions like, why in the world are they talking about this? Like, what the hell is a snip? And I was like, ha, huh, this is something I know. <laughs> What is this? I can yeah. tell you. <laughs> I can provide some help here because I have a very weird niche knowledge about antitrust. Yeah. So, yeah. So I made some good friends on the internet that week. <laughs> they right. could explain to me what the game side was because, you know, I've actually embarrassingly never played Fortnite. Um, and I could explain to them the fucking snip test. What is P okay, so for people who are watching, SNP is what small small non-significant small, price something? Go ahead. Small but significant non-transitory increase in price. Oh wow. Okay. See, this is the sort of shit that antitrust today is sort of about. Yeah. Anyway, the entire point is like if somebody is a monopolist, they could raise price. Like this it's it's actually a pretty basic concept. If somebody is a monopolist, they can raise price and you can't do anything about it, you have to pay it. Yep. That is what the test is trying to show. <laughs> That's it. Uh well look, I love that journey for you. It could not have been me. <laughs> if somebody was like, You have to sit uh and listen to this phone call of economists for seven hours. I would have like a pillow and a blanket and a like warm glass of milk, baby. I'm asleep. I'm not doing nothing like that. <laughs> I will admit that there were some sweatpants involved most oh, of the day. No doubt. No doubt about that. Leah, you're a hero. You're the best. Thank you for supporter. having me you're on. You're the best hey. anime supporter in the world. Thank you for coming on. You said I'm the best one on earth though. So I want to know who is a better antitrust reporter than me on Mars. Maybe they haven't. I don't know. It's probably somebody that, what's his right. name? The Tesla dude has hired. Yeah. Because he's going to colonize Mars. Yeah. <laughs> See, I don't know what I don't know. You know what I mean? <laughs> Whoever it is, is going to be reporting on Jeff Bezos once he gets to the moon to live there to flee from <laughs> Lena Khan's grasp. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was amazing to have you on. Uh, that is our episode. Thank you, Jess, for coming on. That was just awesome. I'm sorry I talk so much. Good Lord, have mercy. Just run in my mouth. Um, thanks for joining us. It was really wonderful. Uh, we will be back next week, of course. In the meantime, you can find this episode and other episodes online, antimonopolyhappyhour.org, or at Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash ronnoxilsr. You can follow us on Twitter, and Time Monopoly HH, the HH stands for happy hour. Next week, we will be on with the big homie, Maurice BP Weeks from the Action Center on Race and the Economy. Can't wait for that. Until then, stay strong, fight the power. Do not let our corporate overlords get you down. And we'll see you next time. Adios.